Ruchem Aboim. Again, welcome to our home. <clears throat> Thank you for attending. Um, now this week, on my thoughts, I would like to look at the relationships that we share with other people. You know, personally, I find people to be my greatest source of joy, but at the same time, they are also my greatest source of anguish. So to begin this thought, I would like to start to tell you a story. You know, they tell a story about a great tzaddik, <clears throat> Repentus of Koritz. He was seen as a spiritual giant in his generation. His greatness was, for the most part, though, unknown to his contemporaries. Well, that fact bothered him little. In fact, just the opposite. It really, it suited him perfectly. It allowed him the time to spend his days and nights immersed in Torah study, prayer, and deep meditation. Since he avoided the public eye, well, he was rarely interrupted. However, over time, the word began to circulate that Repentus was a very special and holy individual. Well, this revelation was possibly due to the praise that was showered upon him by his fellow disciples, who were also students of the holy Baal Shem Tov. People began to visit him on a regular basis, seeking his guidance, requesting his support, asking him to pray for them and beseeching his blessings. Well, the more his words and blessings brought comfort and miraculous results, well, the more they came. What began as a trickle developed into a stream, and then the stream became a flood. Each person came with stories of woe and requests for guidance and blessings. Repinskus was overwhelmed. It had gotten to the point where he felt that he could no longer serve God Almighty properly. He no longer had sufficient time to study, to pray, or to meditate as he had in the past. He was confused, and he wasn't really sure what to do. He felt that he needed more private time and less distractions. He had a dilemma. How could he turn away dozens and even hundreds of people who genuinely felt that he could help them? He wondered how he could convince them that there were other rabbis who were more willing and better qualified than he was and that could help them out. Then a thought struck him. Well, he decided that he would pray for heavenly support in the matter. He would ask God Almighty to arrange <clears throat> that people should no longer be attracted to him. In fact, he prayed that God Almighty should make him despicable in the eyes of all of his followers. You know, our sages tell us that a tzaddik, a righteous individual, is like a mother to God Almighty. As it states, a tzaddik decrees and heaven agrees. So Repentus prayed to God and his prayers were answered. The line of people waiting outside his door totally disappeared. People no longer came to ask for his advice or blessings. Not only that, when he would venture into the town, he was met with averted heads and a chilly atmosphere. Well, rather than being upset with his new status, well, Repentus was thrilled. He was now able to return to his previous lifestyle. He could now devote all of his time to his studies, to his prayer, and to his meditation, all without any interruptions. Now, everything was fine. That was until the days of awe, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur had passed. There were only four days remaining before the holiday of Sukkot, and Repentus had not yet constructed his sukkah. In previous years, there had always been some yeshiva students or local townspeople who were only too eager to help him construct his sukkah. But not this year. Not a single individual showed up to offer their assistance. No one liked him, and therefore no one thought about helping him. Now, he certainly wasn't Noah. He had no knowledge of carpentry. He therefore lacked the ability to construct his sukkah by himself. Finally, having no other choice, he was forced to hire a non-Jew to build a sukkah for him. However, the workmen that he had hired had neither the expertise nor the tools that were needed to complete the job. Then, to his dismay, Repentus could not even find a single Jew in the neighborhood to lend the worker a helping hand, nor were they willing to loan him the necessary tools to build his sukkah. And in the end, it was his wife who was compelled to go door to door to borrow all that was needed. And even that was not accomplished easily due to the prevailing attitude towards her husband. Finally, after much difficulty, he managed to erect a sukkah. 
However, it, it was a far cry from the sukkah the Repinskas was accustomed to construct in previous years. Now that his sukkah was finished, Repinskas hurried off to shul to participate in the holiday evening prayers. Even though he had divorced himself from the townspeople on a daily basis, he still made it a point of attending congregational prayers on all the holidays. This was especially true on the holiday of Sukkot, since Hachnosus Orchen, the concept of hosting guests, is an integral part of the mitzvah of the holiday. He therefore didn't want to miss the opportunity to invite a guest to a sukkah to share in his holiday meal. Now, it was the custom in those days that the poor people in the community who needed a place to eat for the Shabbat or for the holiday meals would gather at the back of the shul. There they would wait for an invitation from one of the congregants. This allowed the shul members to fulfill the mitzvah of taking in guests for the holidays in Shabbosim. Now, this was an easy mitzvah for most of the congregants to observe. That is, everyone, everyone except for Pinchas. It seemed that even those vagrants, those who had no place to eat, turned down his hospitality. He was forced to enter his sukkah by himself without the company of any guests. Uh, he was a bit concerned, since he realized this would now, would now turn out to be the norm and not the exception. He would no longer be able to partake of the myths of taking in guests. However, he thought that henceforth, this would be part of the price he would have to pay for his freedom. However, his thoughts were shaken when he entered his sukkah and began to chant the traditional invitation to the Ushbizin, the heavenly, seven heavenly guests who visit every Jewish sukkah on the holiday. Though these illustrious guests visit all sukkos on the holiday, most Jews are not aware of their presence. However, Reb Pinchas was a great tzaddik and was definitely one of those select individuals who merited to view their presence every year. However, this year was different. When he looked at the doorway of a sukkah, he saw the patriarch, Avram Avinu, Abraham our father, standing at the entrance. But somehow, Avram did not enter his sukkah. Repentus called out to him, Why is it you're not entering? Avram Avinu answered him, I am the embodiment of chesed, kindness. My whole life was dedicated to serving God Almighty through the deeds of loving kindness. Offering hospitality was my mission in life. I cannot enter a sukkah where there are no guests present. At that moment, Repentus realized that he, had re that he had to redirect his priorities. He prayed that God Almighty should restore everything back to where it had been in the past. He prayed that he should once again find favor in the eyes of people, exactly as he had done before. Well, his prayers were answered, and within a short period of time, throngs of people were once again knocking on his door. They came seeking guidance, asking for advice and support. They asked him to pray for them and to bless them. He no longer had time to devote all or even most of his precious time to his own Torah study, prayer, or, medication, or meditation. But he was content knowing that it was no longer a problem. He had learned his lesson well. You know, life is about people and our relationships. Most of us realize that we need tzaddikim, righteous individuals, to lead us. But from this story, we see that the tzaddik, the righteous individual, also needs us in order to be able to fulfill their mission in this world. In reality, we are all one body, each of us dependent on the other. We read in the Torah in the portions of Genesis that God says that it is not good for man to be alone. It was then that God created Eve, the first woman. Man was created to be a social being. And we, we witnessed that solitary confinement is considered to be one of the most severe punishments administered to prisoners. We also read in the Torah that the punishment for a mitzorah, a, a person who was afflicted with the disease of leprosy, which is administered by heaven for the sin of speaking Lashon Hara, tail-bearing, is solitary confinement. A dear friend of mine once told me what he had heard from his mother, that joy with a friend is doubled and troubles are cut in half. And we witness in Jewish history that the greatest threats to our survival as a people have not come from the nations of the world. No, 
They have been the results of the discord that existed amongst our fellow Jews. That is what has brought about our greatest anguish. The second temple was destroyed because of the sin of Sinaschinim, baseless hatred. At that time in history, when the Romans besieged the city of Jerusalem, the city contained enough wood, water, and provisions to withstand a 20-year siege. However, the zealots burnt all the storehouses so that the people would be forced to fight the Romans. It was not the Romans that defeated the Jewish nation. It was the Jews themselves. Hatred among Jews has existed as long as Jews have existed. Yitzchak and Yishmael, Yaakov and Esau, Yosef and his brothers. Sadly, the tradition of Jews fighting with each other has continued all through our history, even up until today. You know, before the massacre that occurred in Israel on October 7th, there was even talk of a civil war breaking out in Israel. After the massacre, the whole country came together in unity. However, it seems that the unity that the nation experienced is slowly dissipating. Even now, there is a division developing in Israel concerning the hostages and the necessity to destroy Hamas. I believe that this lack of actus, unity amongst Jews, is what has been the obstacle standing in the way of the coming of the Messiah. If we can't show love to each other, why should God Almighty want to show love to us? Do we really deserve it? Is being a Jew enough for us to expect God to show us his benevolence? We witness in the Torah that when the children of Israel made the golden calf, that God Almighty was ready to destroy all the people and start all over again with Moshe, fathering a new nation. Rabbi Akiva stated that the most important verse in the Torah is in the book of Leviticus, in the portion of Kedoshim, where it states, V'yahavta l'riacha komocha, that you shall love your fellow human being as you love yourself. The Arizal, Rabbi Isaac Luria, the great Kabbalist, who lived in Sfat, Israel, in the 1500s, stated that one should begin their prayers each and every morning with the words, Harani Kabbalah line, Mrs. Seychelles, that I accept upon myself the positive commandment to love my neighbor as myself. A concept so simple and powerful, and yet it has been an elusive butterfly. If you were to ask religious Jews who observe the laws of the Torah, if they observe this commandment, well, most would answer quickly in the affirmative. Yet, if you were to press them and ask them if they love difficult people, those that do not afford them any honor or gratification, well, their answer may not be the same. Most of us love only lovable people, people that love and honor us. You know, we many times forget to make the effort to love those people that are left-footed, socially awkward, or physically challenged. We need to recognize the importance of what ben Azai stated in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers that there is no man who does not have an hour nor a thing that does not have its place. We need to know with complete certainty that everyone, everyone is important. Everyone has some special contribution that only they can make to humanity. We witness that God Almighty created a perfect world, complete with an abundance of mineral, vegetable, and animal life, yet he only created one human being. But why? This was to teach us the importance of each and every person that exists in his world. If we have saved only one person, we have in essence saved a whole world. All people of the world should practice kindness to each other. This is excellent advice. However, we as Jews have an even greater responsibility to do so. When the children of Israel first entered the land of Canaan under the leadership of Yahushua, they stood on the two mountains, Grisim and Abel, there they accepted upon themselves the concept of Arevis, mutual responsibility. Each and every Jew has taken upon themselves an oath to care for their fellow Jew, an allusion to the fact that we constitute one, one body. This concept of mutual responsibility is not only invoked in a negative sense, meaning that if we have the ability to stop another Jew from transgressing a negative commandment of the Torah, that it is our obligation to do so. But this concept is also relevant in connection with the positive commandments of the Torah, since there is absolutely no way that any one Jew can fulfill all the 613 commandments 
that God in his Torah commands us to observe without invoking this concept. You know, there are many misses in the Torah, such as the ritual of the Parah Duma, the red heifer, a ritual that has only been performed nine times in the history of the world. The tenth time will be performed with the advent of the coming of the Messiah. May he come quickly in our time. The only way for all Jews to observe this commandment is for our souls collectively to connect to the soul of the individual who is performing the act. We as Jews are one body. Whatever affects one part of your body affects all of your body. No one says, you know, that my toe is in pain, but I, I feel good. If your toe hurts, you hurt. So too is our relationship with each and every Jew that has or does exist. That is why the command states to love your fellow human being as yourself, because in a certain sense, they are you. You know, recently I was visiting a relative at a senior residence. As I was leaving, I passed an elderly woman in the hall. I smiled and said, good morning. She smiled back at me and told me that it was her birthday. I wished her a happy birthday. She then asked me if I could give her a hug. I obliged and I gave her a hug. By the look on her face, you would have thought that I had given her a mink coat or, or, or a diamond ring. She was all aglow. There was only a hug, but it was amazing what showing another stranger a little attention could produce. There are times when we all just need a hug. I believe that the greatest obstacle that has stood in the way of the coming of the Messiah has been the lack of ahavas chinam, baseless love between people. The best way for us to demonstrate our love of God is for us to open up our hearts and embrace all of his children with love and affection. We see that God has orchestrated the scenario in Gaza and the hope that it will bring the Jewish nation together as one people in one land serving the one and only God. And with that recognition, we merit to usher in our one and only hope of salvation. Again, the coming of Mashiach Tsukenu now. Let us hope that our prayers will reach the heavens, that the hostages will be freed, that the injured will be healed, that the mourners will be comforted, and that all Israeli soldiers will come back with Mashiach, healthy and victorious. Again, thank you very much for listening. Appreciate it. Again, uh, if you can, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to my, um, nation, my, my site on YouTube. And at the same time, if you can push like, that would again help other things as well. And share as well. Um, again, if you can, again, if you have time, please to look forward to, to after this lecture to a musical rendition of the song that I had written, an original song. Again, once more time, thank you so much for listening. God bless and be well. Shalom.